When the prince's lead, says Deborah, people praise the Lord. But when the princes abdicate their duties, the people suffer. we got plenty of dudes and bros in the church just hanging around. What we need are more men. It's like Kevin DeYoung says, the most important exhortation and complementarianism is not for women to sit down. It is for men to stand up. Which leads us to our third observation from this story. Number three, God curses spectators. As Deborah sings out the victories of God's people, she says, coming to a crescendo in verse 23, curse morose. Said the angel of the Lord, curse its people bitterly because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. Cursed? It doesn't say they did anything bad, does it? It doesn't say this tribe hung back and smoked weed and raided everybody else's tents while they were out fighting. No, it just says they did nothing. Morose represents those people of God who fail to act when it's not their land that's threatened. So you do the geography lesson here. Morose, they, 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 it's not affecting us. These enemies ain't coming after us, so we're going to hang back. Now I want to turn more specifically to some of these issues of justice. Whether we're talking about racial justice or gender justice or what have you. Tragically, when it comes to many issues of justice, there's often been a malaise in the church. That's using the kindest word possible. In large part because the injustice did not directly affect those of us sitting in places of privilege. Like Moreau's, it didn't affect our tribe. At least we didn't think it affected our tribe. The church in the West in various generations has been slow, far too slow, to champion the dignity and equality of really anybody that was outside of their circle. And some of us ask, we look back with genuine bewilderment, and we say, how could some of these great theologians, how could some of our ancestors have either gone along with slavery, someplace even defending it, at the very least just not really seeming to care about it that much, how could a large majority of conservative Bible-believing Christians have just sat on the sidelines during the civil rights? And for the most part, I think you've got to conclude that it just, they felt like it didn't directly affect them, at least in the short run, so they didn't think that much about it. Like Dan, they sat back by the ships when they ought to have been out in the fight. We have to be clear, the scripture says this not getting involved on behalf of others is a matter in God's eyes of justice. Bearing the burden of our brothers and sisters in God's kingdom, even when we think, especially when we think that what is happening doesn't directly affect us, is a matter of justice. Deuteronomy 10, 18, Moses is describing the God that Israel should emulate. He says that God executes justice, a Hebrew word, mishpat, for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. You notice there how he defines justice? The word justice, mishpat, occurs over 200 different times in the Old Testament. And almost always when you see it, or a lot of times when you see it, you'll see four classes of people that are brought up, as in Deuteronomy 10, 18. The widows, the orphans, the foreigners, and the poor. What one scholar calls the quartet of the vulnerable. The just person, according to the law, is the one involved helping those four groups and any others that are marginalized. The just person is not the one that's just paying their taxes. Is not the one that's just going along and not stealing from anybody. The just person in God's eyes is the one who is taking up the cause of the one who is not him or her. One scholar said it this way. In the Old Testament, justice is not just putting down the oppressor. It is also helping to lift up the oppressed. You see, with the blessing of privilege, of whatever kind you want to call it, comes a responsibility to leverage that privilege for the less fortunate. I took a moment to point this out because we tend to put helping the needy or the oppressed under the heading of charity. And we say, well, if you don't do that, then you're stingy. But God calls it injustice, which is a much more serious thing. Silence in the face of injustice is regarded by God to be complicity in that injustice. The New Testament takes it even farther, as it always does. With Jesus, Galatians 6, 2, carry one another's burdens in this way. You will fulfill the law of Christ. That means part of being one body in Christ is being committed to feeling and seeking to understand by listening the pain that others are going through. I've told our congregation that bearing one another's burdens on this issue begins with leaning in to listen and ends with fighting against injustices that our brothers and sisters in Christ are experiencing with as much fervency as we would if it were happening to one of our children. This is where things, I think, really started to change for me. And where they continue to change for me is, as God has graciously put into my life and into our church, Brothers and sisters of color, and it ceases to be a theoretical thing, and it starts to be 
something I'm not reading about on CNN or Fox News. It starts to be a conversation I'm having across the dinner table, and you start to realize, hey, what's this election look like from that perspective? What is that chapter of history? What does that feel like from that perspective? And what is the fact that I never talk about that aspect of that chapter of history? What does that feel like from that perspective? And what does that application process feel like from that perspective? And what is that crime? What is that, what is that police shooting? What does that feel like from that perspective? Yes. 